بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا رب اشرح لنا صدورنا ويسر لنا أمورنا Oh Allah, we ask you to bless us on this evening. We ask you, Ya Allah, to accept from us our gathering. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make this a blessed gathering, a gathering that is surrounded by the malaika. We ask you, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make this every moment that we spend here in the masjid a form of ibadah. Inshallah, every moment that we're spending here together is in the state of ibadah, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up our hearts to the knowledge and open up our hearts to beneficial knowledge and we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to guide us towards beneficial knowledge and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask you ya Allah to make us of those who love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask you ya Allah to make us of those who love to follow in the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam O oh Allah, we ask you to send peace and blessings upon our beloved Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil awaleen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil akhireen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi fil mala il a'la ila yawm al-deen. Brothers and sisters, last time um, we spoke about this idea of leaving our baggage at the door. That as we're approaching the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, we're being very careful not to allow our subjectivities to affect our understanding of the Prophet wasallam. And our hope is that we can approach the Prophet wasallam as objectively as possible. And to learn about him and from him as he was. I want to make one thing clear though, and I hope people didn't walk away with this understanding. I understand that many of us have doubts, and a lot of us have issues that need to be clarified regarding the Prophet A lot of us don't understand various aspects of the seerah, and they're hard for us to swallow. A lot of us need a lot of various clarification. And so, I greatly encourage everybody to come forward, with your doubts, with your thoughts, with your questions, with your needs for clarification. I don't want anyone to think that by leaving the baggage at the door means that you should swallow your doubts or anything along those lines. No. You should bring your doubts forward and we'll discuss them. Write them out on a piece of paper if you're too nervous to speak on the microphone or to say it out loud. Write it anonymously. You don't have to write your name. Whatever it is, but please bring it forward and feel confident in doing so. The next thing that I want to mention in this regard, I mentioned briefly last time this idea of how we learn. And that unless it is given to us in an entertaining fashion, then more often than not we become bored and we're not too interested in learning. Unless it comes to me in some nice encapsulated, you know, nice little capsule for me to swallow, I'm going to get bored, I'm going to walk away. And I want us to really understand that this is a very problematic feature of our society. We don't appreciate how much beneficial knowledge we prevent ourselves from when the one signifying feature that dictates whether or not I'm going to learn is being, it being entertaining or not. Think about it. Think about how much knowledge we've deprived ourselves of because the clip wasn't entertaining. Or the lesson didn't have a lot of nice stories. It didn't have a lot of exciting you know, stories about wars and events and so on. So we got bored. You know, I know last week when I was speaking about the sources of Sira, I saw a lot of eyes kind of glossy-eyed. Because we're not used to listening to someone talk about the sources of knowledge, books and names and so on. And I know, I know that it's a challenge. Our generation specifically, this society that we live in does not encourage knowledge. It doesn't. Generally speaking, we more often than not encourage ignorance. Simply take what I want you to take. But don't spend too much time digging deeper and deeper. Don't 
you know, don't uh, inform this too much. And we need to move away from this. You know, one thing about our parents' generation, and my father is sitting here, and, and this is something that I really learned from him by observing. I remember years ago, maybe 15 years ago, when my older brother was teaching my father how to use the internet. And he was teaching him, like, you know, what pages and I don't know what else. And the one thing that I noticed my father doing that all of us never did was he read line by line everything that was being said. So a page came up and he would say, okay, hold on, hold on. And he would read the entire page to understand what was being said. There was a, there's a thoroughness to our father's generation, our parents' generation, that we're losing. This idea that I'm not really interested, just give me a summary. Give me the footnote version. Give me the, the spark notes version. I don't really want to know all the details. Just give me the brass tags. Or, my source of knowledge will primarily be entertainment. You know, you'll ask someone, do you know the story of the Prophet ﷺ? I'm like, yeah, I watched the message. And suddenly I know the Prophet ﷺ. You know something about Sayyidina Isa? Yeah, I watched the Passion of the Christ. Is this really going to be the source of this generation's knowledge? Some basic spark notes, some Wikipedia pages, and some movies, and that's what makes us who we are? We have to be very careful about this point. And it's going to require that we really push ourselves to learn how to learn. And spend the necessary time, taking the time to read, learn, and understand. There are times this depth will be spiritual. There are times this dars will be purely about the ethics of the Prophet and his character. There are times where this dars will be a bit more academic. There are times this dars will be about, a bit about events and wars and so on. No matter what the case is, we're here to learn. And we are going to dedicate ourselves to the process of learning. So don't rush events. Don't think that I want that part of the seerah. Forget about all that. Take it week by week as it comes. And I promise you, inshallah, it will be beneficial for all of us, inshallah, in this day, this life, and the next. And this leads me into the idea of why do we study history? We study history in large part because Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran pointed us to the reflection about the people who have passed. قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا انظروا كيف فعلنا بهم. Look at what we did with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an so many stories. قَوْمَ عَاد, قَوْمْ ثَمُود The people of Lut, the people of Nuh, the people of Musa. Stories upon stories upon stories. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an references us to look at. How do we consume those stories? How do we reflect upon those stories? One of the biggest problems that we have when it comes to assessing history is the storification of history. And by that I mean that we simply turn the past into stories. Stories to be heard, stories to be referenced here and there, stories that show that you have some knowledge of history, or stories to be entertained by. But how often do we actually heed what Allah Azza wa Jal has told us about reading in our history and that we actually try to learn our history. We try to actually look and assess what did the people of the past actually do. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling me go back and learn and read and be careful. Don't fall into the same mistakes of these people. If you do A, B, C, and D, you will fall and follow the same path of the people who have preceded you. This is a big, big, big issue, brothers and sisters. Because when we storify history, it does very specific things. One, storification of history, you know what it does? It puts a big division between me and the history. So when I look, for example, at the people of Ad or the people of Thamud, I'll say, oh, 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 that has nothing to do with me. I'm far removed from that. Or when we look, today we're going to speak briefly, inshallah, 
about the people, the Arab Peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula before the coming of the Prophet. How many of us, when we think of the Jahili period, all we think about is blood, drinking, fornication, and the killing of daughters? Is that not what we've reduced the time period before the coming of the Prophet to being? Now, is that really a fair assessment of that time period? We'll see in a moment. But the problem by reducing history into these nice little stories is that we remove ourselves from actually learning from that history. And we make it as if those histories are distant and we have nothing to do with that. Those are those evil, barbaric, whatever people. But we, we're a different people. We're a modernized people. We're a great people. We have this and that. This is the best that society has ever arrived at, who we are today. And that's one of the biggest problems of our modern day, is what we've done to our history. Because we don't learn from our history. And time and time again, if we just wake up, we will see the same mistakes of history repeating day in and day out. But because we've removed ourselves from history in that way, then we've just turned it into this evil other, this simple other thing that has nothing to do with me. So there are no real lessons for me to learn from that. You see the danger of doing that? There's no way for me to actually learn them. When Allah is telling me, go back and learn, Siru, look, read, look at the people of Ad, look at the people of Thamud, look at Qawmulud, look. And I just look at them as nice stories. This is a huge danger that we have to be careful of. Another problem of reducing the Arabian people, the people of the Arabian Peninsula and others into these simple categories is the idea of creating binaries. And I'll explain what that means, what I mean by that. By that, I mean that when we have no nuanced look into history, we don't actually sit there and assess what history was, what happened to those people, our minds develop this outlook of, you're either good or bad. Those people bad, us, we're good. You're with us or you're against us. You're this or you're that. You're, you're bigoted or you're not bigoted. Very simple binaries. Because it's convenient. I don't want to take the time to actually assess who these people were. So the convenient thing for me to do is just categorize them as evil and that's it. And put them into that category of evil. Because if I give them some complexity, if I actually give them something more than just tagging them as evil, then I have to actually engage with them. And that's problematic. Because I need this evil other. I need to define others as being evil or being lost, being backward, being retarded, so that I can up myself. I can praise myself. I become myself the spectacular thing where these people become an evil other. And this is extremely dangerous. Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, not everything is black and white. Nothing is black and white. Very few things are black and white. But most things are very nuanced. You know, I'll be honest. And I'll be a little bit maybe controversial when it comes to the issue of homosexuality. Today what's happening is people, and we're going to talk about this inshallah here, not in this session, but we're going to introduce some, some new programming soon inshallah, and it will be announced, our brothers will announce it. But when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, today you have one or two options. You either accept, so you're a good person, or you reject, you're bigoted. You're a bigot. You're someone who hates people to have the freedom of right. The right to do whatever they want. The right to express. So now, we feel cornered. Either I accept it, or reject it. Correct? And I see this challenge in high school in college, in the workplace, in society as a norm. People are now looking at Muslims and Jews and Christians. What are you guys going to say? How are you going to react? And so we feel cornered. Okay, alright, we'll accept. No, 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 I can't. I reject. Is the issue that simple? Is the issue that black and white? Of course, from the Muslim perspective, of course, from the Muslim perspective, Muslims do not accept homosexuality. قَوْلًا wahida. Absolutely no thoughts about it. Islam does not allow homosexuality. Is there a way for a Muslim 
to not agree with homosexuality without being a bigot? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and that is a very viable option. I'm not going to get into details now because this is not the time for it. But the idea is, it's a very nuanced thing that requires that we learn and requires that we learn how to learn and be able to argue things for what they actually are. So, we're going to, inshallah, study this period, the pre-Islamic period, to do a few things. Number one, to understand where people went wrong. Where people went at times, grossly wrong. Number two, to understand where people went right. And the good things that people did, and the virtuous things that people did. We learn the things that people did wrong, so that we do not do it. And we learn the people, the things, the virtuous things that people did, so we can learn and, and learn from it and embrace it. The third thing to understand is that to really be able to understand the transformation that the Prophet ﷺ did, we have to contextualize the Prophet. We have to understand the world that he came into. What did the world look like? What kind of things were prominent? What kind of things were predominant? How did people function? What did people believe in? Etc. All of that gives us insight to see that yes, the Prophet when coming to deal with this issue, he introduced this value and this idea. And when he came to transform this ailment, this is how he did it, step by step by step. And we'll see inshallah as the weeks progress and we get into the seerah of the Prophet and we see his life, we'll see how he dealt with various things. Some things, it was black and white. Stop it and it stopped for various reasons. Other things required time for change to occur. But the only way that we can really appreciate that nuance is by understanding the context and what he actually did. And the last thing that we are benefit from from studying this historical period is to understand human nature and to understand that there is a very common theme about human nature that humans are humans people humans forget humans are misguided there's a very recurring theme that exists in history you know the people ulama say al insan wa ma summi al insanu insanan illa li annahu yansa that the insan, the insan meaning human, which can be conjugated from nasiya, from to forget, that the human was called a human because the human forgets. The human constantly forgets, is not paying attention. So when we learn and we see, wow, look at human nature, look what happens in human nature, that is very relevant for us because we're humans, we're not perfect. And there's a lot of problems that we are facing that we have to address. So, Ahmoudi, Ahmoudi, turn on the uh, projector. Shukran. Uh, Ahmed, I'm sorry. Ahmoudi because he's my nephew. <laughs> well, his name is Ahmed. He's turning 17 tomorrow. So, inshallah, as he's turning on the projector, um, we're going to, hopefully, inshallah, we're going to take this mindset into the study of this time period, into the study of this region, and inshallah, I hope, I, I doubt we're going to finish today this specific section. We may have to finish it next week. But nonetheless, let us take it time by time and really try to extract as many benefits as possible. Just this one's fine. Can everyone see the... It's fine? Okay. So this is the world at the time when the Prophet ﷺ is born. When the Prophet ﷺ is born... You have two major superpowers. Who are they? Who are the two major superpowers during that time? Persians. Who? Persians. The Persians and? Byzantine. The Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire. Beautiful. They are situated to the north of the Arabian Peninsula. So, Roman Empire to this side, Sassanid or the Sasanian, whatever, the Persian Empire to that side. These are the two most powerful entities in the world at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the superpowers. The Roman Empire is a Christian empire. They're Christian. Now there's a lot to be learned, by the way, about the Roman Empire. I'm not going to get into too many details. But one very interesting thing is that 300 years before the advent of the Prophet ﷺ, a change occurred in the Roman Empire. Where an emperor by the name of Constantine, 
decided to take a minority religion, which was Christianity in the Roman Empire, and make it the state-run religion, the state-sanctioned religion. And he chose one very specific line of Christianity, and that was the line of St. Paul. There were various forms of Christianity, but he chose the Paulian Christianity, and that is the Christianity that introduced ideas of the divinity of Jesus, and the Trinity, and other problematic, no, no, it's just one slide, and other problematic notions that were introduced into Christianity. And so you see in the span of, he basically decided to make one form of Christianity, the state sanctions Christian religion, and he persecuted everyone else. And at the time of the advent of the Prophet wasallam, there were major problems occurring in both empires. The, the, the Roman Empire was being plagued with strong status stratification, meaning that you had elites, you had the slaves that were treated as less than animals, you had various issues that are occurring. But one very important thing to understand is that they were a well-established structure. And I want you to keep this in mind because it's going to make sense all the way in, like maybe tonight or tomorrow, when, when next week when we speak about why Allah chose the Arabian Peninsula. The Roman Empire was extremely established. It had a state religion, it had an already established governmental structure and other things. But at that time it was in the decline. The other empire was the Persian Empire. In the Persian Empire, their religion was what? Zoroastrianism, right? They believed fire worship. It is very interesting, there's a lot to learn, but that was their primary belief system, and they had major social issues. One of the things that had become predominant in their, in their uh, civilization was incest, especially between the hierarchy. And they had various other issues that we won't get into. Then you have other civilizations, other powers existing in the, uh, in the world in general. So you have India. India is another civilization, but it's much weaker than the Roman and the Persian Empire. You have the Greeks. The Greeks is another existing civilization, but they are also weak. They have also, they're not weak, but they have, they're much weaker than the superpowers. They're not major players, but they also have their established philosophies and governmental structures and so on. You also have the Chinese. Now surrounding the Arabian Peninsula, you have to the north, Bilad al-Sham, which is the Ghassanid dynasty. And that was a Christian dynasty that was under whose auspices? The Roman Empire. So Bilad al-Sham, Syria at that time, was under control by the Roman Empire. And this is very important to understand. And then the southern region in Yemen, in Yemen you had a very conflicted region, very conflicted area, but they themselves had primarily a strong Persian influence. The Christians and Jews were warring in that region, but primarily it was a heavily Persian influence. And from Yemen comes a story that we'll hear later on, not today, maybe next week, the story of Abraha and Ashab al Right? He comes out of that southern region of Yemen. To the, well, to the east of the Arabian Peninsula you have Iraq. Is this? Oh, that's what you're saying. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> it keeps on telling me, you know. <laughs> so you have Iraq over here, right? And then you have other empires. So you have the uh, Abyssinia over here and Egypt. Egypt is, is under Roman rule as well and so on. Anyway. The point is that this is the world as it looked. The Arabian Peninsula was flanked from the north and the south. The, the north, the, the Bilad al-Sham, which was a part of the Roman Empire, and then the south, which was heavily influenced by the Persian Empire. And that's pretty much that. Right? So that's the general world as it looked during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And I hope we can take this, because for me it's very important to see how things looked. Take this and go and try to understand each one of these civilizations and what happened to them. Because many historians, when they talk about this centuries, the 5th and 6th century, they talk about a strong decline in the world. There was a major problem happening in the world. And it's a very interesting history to see. Because when the advent of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Prophet came, the changes that he made were truly remarkable. And the existing entities that, that were there, they're there, these deep, rich civilizations, you see how they were either directly or indirectly influenced by the coming of the Prophet Okay? So that's 
the powers around the Arabian Peninsula. Now, coming to the actual Arabian Peninsula, which is this middle region, just so that we're clear, because not everything here is Arabian, it's this area. This is the deserts of Syria. So it's this area right here. To understand this region, we have to go back from the time of the Prophet, which the Prophet was born in which century? In the Common Era? The 6th century. We have to go back to 3000 BC. 3000 BC, so we're talking about two, 3000 years before the time of the Prophet. That's when the, the story really kind of shaped up, shaped up for us. There was clearly things before that. But that's where things start for us. Before that you had Ad and Thamud, they were in this region. But they're considered, as the ulama say, al arabul Ba'ida, the perished Arabs. So Ad and Thamud, these two stories that we hear in the Quran, they're from Qawm Salih and, and Hud and so on. They come before the time of the Prophet, before 3000 BC, before the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim. And generally those types of Arabs are perished. They no longer exist. Right? And there's a lot to be learned in that regard, but just keep that in mind. For our sake, the Arabs that settle in the Arabian Peninsula and eventually become the Arabs of today, so the Arabs that we have today are very much offspring of the Arabized Arabs. The story goes, and the Arabized Arabs are the offspring and the lineage of who? Sayyidina Ismail. And I'll explain why. So you have Sayyidina Ibrahim. This is 3000 BC. Where is Sayyidina Ibrahim? Where is he? I can't hear. Iraq. He's in Ar, in Iraq. Sayyidina Ibrahim starts over here in Iraq. And then he travels north, north, Palestine. Then he goes to Egypt. What happens in Egypt? When he's in Egypt, he meets the king and that famous story happens when the king wants Sayyidina Sara and so on. And the king, after feeling guilty or whatever, he gives Sayyidina Ibrahim who? Sayyidina Hajar. Sayyidina, Sayyidina Ibrahim births in Egypt who? Sayyidina Ismail. And for whatever issues, he takes Sayyidina Ismail and Sayyidina Hajar and goes where? Settles in Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Sayyidina Ibrahim to take Sayyidina Ismail and Sayyidina Hajar to settle in Mecca. Now Sayyidina Ismail is an Iraqi at that point, right? Because he's, well, he's half Iraqi, half Egyptian. So how does he become Arab? Well, he marries when they're established there and when they're born and they grow after they build the Kaaba. And this is very important to understand. Sayyidina Ibrahim established the origins of the divine faith. After they build the Kaaba, after the story of Zamzam, after the story of As-Safa wal Marwa, all of that, and Ibrahim Sayyidina Ismail grows, this Muslims or Arabs from this area, the Qahtani Arabs, from Ya'rab ibn Qahtan, that's where the name Arab comes from, they travel north to Mecca. And they go and they see that a woman and her child are with Zamzam. And they say, we want to stay with you. And so they stay and she tells them, you can stay, but I'm the one who's going to be in charge of Zamzam. They fight fine. So clearly you have this Arab tribe, the Qahtani Arabs. They are the ones who move up and eventually Sayyidina Ismail marries from the Qahtani Arabs. And from him descend all of the Arab tribes that come after that. So thousands of years of tribes being developed in the Arabian Peninsula. That's where you have all of these various tribes that we read of in our history from Khuza'a and all of them, Banu Umayyah and all of these names, they are offspring of Sayyidina Ismail. Sayyidina Ismail had 12 kids and from those 12 kids, generation after generation, you have the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. Alright? I know that's a little bit historical, but it's good perspective. So, what then are the, the, the nature of this region. What are some of the major features? Now we're going to fast forward 2,000 years. We're going to move back after understanding the origins. We're going to move back to the time preceding the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. What was the nature of the civilization? What was the nature of the Arabian people? So to understand first, let's talk about landscape. Because landscape is very important as time progresses. We will see that the Arabian Peninsula is an extremely arid area. It's a very dry place. 
Yes, it's exposed to the world, it's exposed to various parts of the world, but the nature of the Arabian Peninsula, because of its geological conditions, is a very insular region. So although it's exposed to the world, it's actually not exposed to the world. And the people that make up the Arabian Peninsula are purely just from that area. So the Arabian Peninsula was never occupied. The Arabian Peninsula was never occupied by any forces. They were always Arabized Arabs. They were always from the offspring of Sayyidina Ismail. The key, er, the key aspect about their region was so many people could come and from India or from China bring goods and they would have these trade routes through the Arabian Peninsula. But the Arabs, the tribes, they're the ones who took the goods from one area to the next, from the south to the north, etc. And that was primarily their system of economics. They were very much a people who just depended on trade and business, nothing else for their well-being, for their, for their income. But they were an insular people, very dry, rugged conditions. It was not easy to live in the Arabian Peninsula. And that shaped the people of the Arabian Peninsula, what they, what, what they became and how they were as individuals and as peoples. So, uh, like we said, the rough climate, there were no external forces that ever occupied, and that's very important to understand. Now, when it comes to the political situation, you basically have these various warring tribes. There is no central government, there is no central governmental structure that is dictating the affairs of the peninsula and so on. It is just these tribes that exist, some tribes are a little bit more noble than other tribes, some tribes are wealthier than other tribes, and they're scattered out throughout the region. Now, I just want to take a quick pause and say this. I know generally in Sira people say a lot of, mention a lot of names and dates and, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of names in history that I'm not mentioning. But I suggest for this dars that if you want a lot of the specifics, pick up the book that we mentioned last time, A Sealed Nectar, The Sealed Nectar by Sheikh Mubarak Furi, to get all of the necessary names and dates that exist. But for our sake, because we want to keep this a bit more general, and we want to really focus on the lessons that can be learned, and we want to talk in general about the Prophet wasallam, we're going to keep it to this level, inshallah. But I suggest that you go back, pick up Rahik al Makhtoum, and really focus on that time period. Don't just skip through the Arab, you know, the, the pre Islamic Arabian period, just skip through it and rush into the Sita. No, spend time actually reading and understanding those names and peoples and dates. So the political situation, like we said, is that there's no central government, it's just these tribes. And the central, the city center, if you will, the central location in the Arabian Peninsula, the key location is Mecca. It is the Kaaba, built by Sayyidina Ibrahim. That is the central area in the region. That's where everyone is flocking to. So you have the Hajj season, which is a very critical season in the year of the Arabian people, where you have all of these different tribes coming together. So politically speaking, it's very key. For example, the 360 idols that we hear of that were surrounding the Kaaba when the Prophet came, we think they're just idols. They were very key strategic um, factors that had to be there to secure economic uh, needs and purposes. So for example, one of the ways in which that you protected your trade routes was by having your idol represented in the Kaaba. So if you say, for example, if you protect this trade route of ours, we will take your idol and we'll put it in the Kaaba. It was a time for all of these tribe leaders to come and sit down and discuss very strategic political affairs and whatnot. Right? So there are a lot of aspects of the political situation that are key to understand so that when we see how the Prophet was able to influence, he was greatly able to influence because there was no centralized structural government. They were these disparate parts that he was able to combine and we'll get into that as time progresses inshallah. So now when we talk about the social life of the Arabs, when we think of the Arabs, like I said, we think of a people who are engaged in a lot of vices. So, for example, some of the vices that they were engaged in, some of the evil or the, the very difficult parts to swallow about the Arabian Peninsula was this concept of the female fantasite. They had institutionalized this idea of killing your child. 
killing your daughter because of a concept of honor that was flawed. So they believed that it was a dishonor and so it was better to kill off your daughter at a young age. And we have a lot of stories that are very difficult to hear about how these daughters were killed, they were fathers would take their daughters into the middle of the desert at the ages of five and six, and the daughter would look at him and be scared, where are you taking me? And the stories are very difficult to hear, but that was taking place. And it was coming out of a flawed concept of honor. Right? It wasn't as if they just wanted to, you know, yes, to them, human life did not inherently have a value. In the sense that they could easily kill people if they thought that they were crossing them. Right? So for example, one of the aspects of, of, of the political condition was that might was right. If you're within your tribe, you're protected. But if you veer out of your tribe, you're fair game. And that was acceptable. So you could be killed by any of the other tribes if you cross territories. But inside your tribe, you were protected. Right? So you could easily be killed outside of your tribe. There was no, con there was no consideration for human life in that regard. There's an idea of human value that we have today that supersedes all of this. But in that, re in that time, that wasn't the case. Marriage or relations between men and women was extremely problematic. There were so many various illicit forms of relations between men and women. There was the normal style of marriage that we have today where a man goes and asks for a woman, gives dowry and so on. That existed. But that generally existed only in the elite class of women. Not necessarily in the regular women, not the non-elite. Because there was this distinction in the Arabian times between elite women and not. Like we, we know the story of Khadija, عليها, we know the story of Hind. These were women who came out of that time period. And Khadija was a formidable woman. I mean, she was someone who was a great business, uh, she, was a, she was a great trader and she was an honored woman. So the elite women of the Arabian Peninsula, they were given certain status. But the non-elite women, everything was fair game. So for example, you know, one of the forms of marriage that they had was that a woman would basically go and have relations with ten men. And after having the relations with ten men, she would basically choose who's going to father her child. Or the husband would tell his wife, go sleep with this man because I want our child to have... His, his genes. And he would come back and this would be his son. This was acceptable. This was something that was completely acceptable. The, the, the culture of the people was heavily motivated by personal desire. Whatever I wanted, whatever I desired, I took. I don't really care about more than just the simple fact that this is what I want so I take it. This is what I yearn for, so I drink it, so I have relations with this woman, whatever the case may be. Clearly, the Arabian Peninsula had many, many vices that we are aware of and that we wholeheartedly reject. On the, so, uh, with, with women, with drinking, with killing, with all of these aspects. But what I want us to consider is, to what extent are we really, as a people, as a society, so far removed from that time period. The vices that existed in that time, are we truly and utterly far removed from that time period so there's no real similarities? Or are there actual similarities between that time period and today? This is a very important question to ask because if we think to ourselves, well they were engaged in all these barbaric acts, but we don't do any of that. But is that really the case? Think about our times. Do we not engage as a society in various forms of illicit behavior? Isn't, for example, fornication very rampant in our society between men and women, between men and men, between women and women, etc.? Is this not a common feature of our society? So how come we are not so bothered by what we see today, but when we look at them, we are beyond disgusted. What is it? What's the, what's the disconnect that's happening? We have normalized our situation, and we have made it that it's okay what's happening today. Yeah, yeah, it's not good, 
but we're okay with it. And by okay, I mean that when we see this kind of behavior on TV, we don't turn away. We don't hate it. We don't look at it and say, wow, that is really something that I despise. I dislike that part of my society. I dislike that part of my culture. Because we've normalized it. Because we've been made to think that this is okay. But for us as Muslims, what distinguishes something as being okay or not, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, this is not okay, or this is okay. This is very important for us, to understand that what we define as good or bad, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us as good and bad. And so when we see illicit behavior in society today, we say this is tremendously evil, this is not good. We are not okay with this. We have to hate it with our hearts, we have to reject it. Now, it's one thing to hate it with your heart, it's another thing to figure out how am I going to remedy the situation? What kind of steps do I have to take to actually remedy my condition? But we're not so far removed from the past civilization and the past people. If we look at the injustices that occur in our society today, look at, look at what's happening in the prison system. Look at what's happening to the African American people in our society. Is it not so ridiculously disproportionate that the overwhelming majority of people who occupy our prison system are blacks and Latinos? Is that not a gross form of injustice? There are so many aspects of our society that are extremely problematic. But we have become so desensitized that we've normalized it. We haven't put a microscope on top of ourselves and say, hold on, really, what are we about? What are the future people going to say about our times? When there's plenty of killing, rape, death, destruction, we have our own forms of female infanticide, by the way. We have the death of children killed because of honor in various parts of the world. You know, brothers and sisters, abortion, I know it's a complex issue. And the fuqaha discuss it extensively. And I won't get into it. But there are definitely forms of abortion that are atrocious. That we should absolutely reject. But for us, the abortion debate just comes to, down to, you're either a progressive, liberal, dem democrat, or you're a republican. That's the whole discussion about abortion. We don't actually think, hold on, there are actually forms of abortion that are absolutely rejectionable. They cannot, can we come to a child who's in the latest st stages of birth, and there are no real needs to abort, but just because I want to abort, I abort, and we are accepting of that? That as a society we're okay with that? Right, so the more we dissect our own society, the more we will find there are major issues that have to be addressed. That we're not so far removed from the, from the Arabian people, from the people of that time, that we have our own vices that have to be addressed. We have to really assess ourselves and what we're about and what we have become. So, as we mentioned, the negative aspects of the Arabian Peninsula. Now let's ask ourselves, what are some of the virtuous aspects of the Arabian Peninsula? Because no people are absolutely evil. People can be, have their evil sides, but they can definitely have their good sides. So what were some of the virtuous features? One, the Arabs were very trustworthy, honest people. They stuck to their word. They never lied. They rarely ever lied. They were an honest people that you could trust. There's a very famous story where Abu Sufyan, when he is in, uh, when he's in the Roman Empire, he's visiting on some business. And Heraclius at that time hears that a man by the name of the Prophet comes. And so he says, go look for some Arabs. And he finds Abu Sufyan, his viziers find Abu Sufyan, they bring him to him. And they say, tell us about this Prophet. And Abu Sufyan begins to show Heraclius that the Prophet ﷺ was coming with all of these virtues. He wasn't, he didn't mean to praise him. But when Heraclius asked him, tell us about this man, they say, he's ordering us to be good to our families, to be good in society, to not do this, to not do that, to honor this, to honor that. 
He says, what else? What does he tell you regarding uh, belief? He says, he, he's telling us to stay away from these idols and move towards God and so on and so forth. Heraclius' response to him is what? I will not be sitting here for much longer. If this is what this man is coming with, then I will not be sitting in this seat for much longer. Now Abu Sufyan could have easily said anything about the Prophet ﷺ. But when he was asked, he gave an honest answer. That is a very beautiful trait to have, by the way. That is something that we ourselves can use a lot of. We can use this beautiful aspect of being honest and trustworthy. The Arabs had a very strong sense of honor. They were an honorable people. You could not walk over the Arabs. They stuck to what they believed in, whether you liked it or not. Now they were honor, they, they had a sense of honor to a fault, meaning that they could easily kill for the sense of honor. They buried their daughters alive out of a sense of honor. But it's a very virtuous trait that the Prophet ﷺ was able to utilize and build off of to build or to grow the Islamic civilization. Another very key aspect, virtuous aspect of the Arabian people was that they were extremely hospitable people. They were very welcoming. They always, if anyone asked to stay with them, they would allow you to stay. And they would do whatever they could to make your stay comfortable. They would sacrifice their own well-being to make sure that you could eat. So they would slaughter their last sheep. They would go and struggle to go, or they'll send their children out to go into the middle of the desert to get you some food if they didn't have any. And it all came out of a strong sense of honor. One of the most key aspects about the Arabian people was their purity of spirit. See, the Arabs were a simple people. They weren't a complex people. They weren't philosophically bogged down with a lot of baggage from philosophers and thinkers and so on. They were pure people. And it was very much an expression of their, of their, their location. Because they lived in the desert. And all they saw was nature all the time. right? And they, all they cared about was their kin and their tribe and their people. And they had no influences from f philosophies of the past or you know these empires or whatever they were a simple people and that was a great breeding ground for growth and development when you have a people that are pure that are honest that are simple simply spirited they're ready to accept a lot more than others are others who are bogged down with deep philosophies and this is key to understand why the arabian peninsula was chosen Another key virtuous aspect about the Arabian people was that they were strong and brave. They were a very brave people. They did not fear anybody. They would go out and they would fight the fights that needed to be fought. No matter what the circumstances were. They didn't cower to anybody. And by the way, the list goes on. And the reason why I outline all of these virtual characteristics, these virtuous characteristics, is to understand that there was a lot of goodness that existed in the Arabian Peninsula that the Prophet ﷺ could grow with. He could really do a lot with what was there. And he had a nice khama, right? Nice khama that he could work with, a nice ore, a nice original piece that he could work with and he could grow from. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he speaks about himself, he says, وَمَا بُعِثْتُ إِلَّا لِيُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ That when I have been sent, I have been sent to perfect the best of character that existed. So for our sake, we have to understand that as we take the time to assess the evils of our society that exist and that they do exist, we take just amount of time, the same amount of time, to assess, assess the virtuous aspects of our society. There are a lot of good traits about the society that we live in. I find constantly that people are very simple. People are very good-hearted. People, generally speaking, are good-willed. People, generally speaking, want to help you. You know, a lot of what we see coming and directed specifically towards the Muslims is a lot of brainwashing. 
a lot of misinformation, a lot of misconceptions. But there's so much goodness that we can go from in society. So many virtuous aspects that we have in society today that we can grow from. So just as the Prophet ﷺ was able to look and really teach us about the virtuous aspects of the Arabian people and to build from there, we too have to look into the, to our societies and see where we can build from. And I'll say this, and I'll say this honestly, there are a lot of non-Muslims who act in a much more Islamic way than Muslims do. And this is a very honest assessment. You know, if we are going to think that we're going to take the Prophet ﷺ and we're going to be these transformative entities, how can that be the case when at times Muslims are considered amongst themselves the least trustworthy people? That go to Muslims, there are a lot of racists amongst the Muslims. You can't trust a Muslim uh, worker. They'll cheat you. They'll this, they'll that. How can we expect that the Prophet Allah Azza wa Jal will yajri at that he will make change happen on our hands if we ourselves are not virtuous peoples. This is, this is very important to understand. We're not here studying these things simply to kind of make ourselves feel good about ourselves. That this is who we are. No, we're not this. We have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do. Insha'Allah, we can definitely be that. And this is one of the most beautiful parts about studying the seerah. And it gives me great inspiration, is to see how some of the worst people, really very evil people, became the most amazing people that this world ever saw. That to me is extremely inspiring. But there is a method for that to happen. And there is a process that we have to go through. So as we are taking the time to really assess what is happening in society, we're also assessing ourselves. We're assessing our condition, our actions, where we lack, what we need to be doing, what is virtuous about ourselves, and where we lack greatly. And all of this is done in a process to understand how we can make the change that we want to make. And lastly, um, and we'll close with this because the time in next week, inshallah, we'll, take it, we'll talk about the religious situation. The last aspect is the Arabs' appreciation for the Arabic language. The Arabs were a very poetic people. They loved Arabic poetry. And they were extremely, they felt honored by their poetry. And their poetry was an extremely critical part of their society. Near the Kaaba, you had the Mu'allaqat al sabah Hanging on the Kaaba, you would have every year a big competition, basically like our Super Bowl or something, where all of the major shu'ara, the poets would come, and they would give their poetry, and the judges would be there, and they would assess who gave the best poetry, and their poetry was hung on the Kaaba. The reason why this is important is when we see how much they valued the Arabic language and how much they va valued the nuance of the Arabic language and to them poetry was so profoundly powerful and it was given this huge station in their society you'll see the significance of the Qur'an in that context that when the Qur'an, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come to these people they are utterly shocked you know, here's a people that they really honored their language. They really honored their poetry. But when they saw the Qur'an, they saw something profound. They saw something completely different. And it really shocked them at their core. A few khutab ago, I mentioned the story of Surah Al-Najm. When it came down and the Prophet took it to Kaaba And he read it in front of the, 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 the mushrikeen of Quraysh. And at the end of the, the, the surah, when they were done, when the Prophet was done, and the last verse of the Qur'an, that surah is what? فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا All of the mushrikeen of Quraysh fell into sujood. All of them fell into sujood. And they were not Muslim. But because the words of the Qur'an were so profound and so powerful, they couldn't help but absorb and embrace it and really see tremendous 
uniqueness in it, almost miraculousness in it. And it is miraculous. And so when we come to assess this part of the Arabian Peninsula, and we can juxtapose that against the Qur'an, we can see the true linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. And we will get into it as we, the Qur'an is revealed during the time of the Prophet. We'll see how this was truly miraculous. And how this spoke to very specific realities in the Arabian Peninsula. And this is also important for us to understand from another perspective. And that is, we have to really understand what is powerful in society. What are the sources of power in society? What makes people, what influences people? What various forms of media, institutionalization, what aspects of our society are the sources of power? This is very important for us to understand, to assess, just as the Prophet and through the Qur'an was able to really transform the perception of the Arabs, that we tap into those necessary sources, that inshallah we can alter the perception of others towards the Muslimin. So with that inshallah I'll close because the time has ended. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this gathering um, a blessed gathering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts and minds to these lessons. I hope inshallah we're able to take the necessary lessons from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah I know this time period is a little bit dry. But inshallah there are many lessons to be learned and we hopefully can learn them bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in.